Do you ever think about words? Does salary have anything to do with salt and sauce? How about across different languages? You can tell escribir and escribir are related to each other, or even schreiben und schreiben, but the word write is not related to them. The same way, war can't be related to guerre or guerra, right? Well, surprisingly, war and guerra come from the same word, just as insect and sex have the same origin. Intrigued? Stick around and let's look at etymology and some surprising origins of words. Hi, welcome to Snap Language. I'm Mark Franco. Words have a life of their own. They're born, change, reproduce by generating new words and by spreading into other languages, like viruses. And words even get old and die. They just fall out of use. In Latin, they use the word sal, salt, to create the word salarium. Old French borrowed that as salaire. Later, English borrowed that from French as salary. But what was the connection in Latin between salt and salary? Etymologists believe the word was salarium in Latin because it was salt money or an amount to buy salt, which was very valuable back then. Historical linguistics studies language change over time. Etymology is a subfield of that. It's the study of word origins and derivations and how words change over time. For example, an oxa, many oxen in Old English became an ox, many oxen in Modern English. And that's why ox still has this irregular plural today. Words also change meaning over time. That's what historical linguists call semantic change. For example, originally when nice was borrowed into English from Old French, it meant foolish. Then, over time, it meant timid, fussy or fastidious, delicate, precise and careful, delightful, and finally, kind and thoughtful. We still have these meanings today, but we lost the original meaning foolish. Except perhaps when you say someone is too nice. The word meat meant any kind of food in Old English. By around the 1300s, its meaning had narrowed to the meaning we still have today, only animal flesh. Okay, I need to make a disclaimer here. I am not a trained etymologist. I just know enough about the area and find it really interesting. So, this video is not meant to be an in-depth study of etymology. That would be a really long video. War comes from Old French guerre. In late Old English, it became where, well, guerre, where, where, war. That's how this one word, guerre, became what, on the surface at least, seems to be very different words, guerre, war. Why study etymology? When we understand how words and their meanings change over time, we learn about linguistic processes, how people use words and change their sounds and meanings, how languages borrow words from each other and change their pronunciation to conform to the phonology of the language. Well, we learn how language itself changes over time, not just how it changed in the past, but also how it's in the process of changing right now. Latin sal changed in other languages into sal, sel, salz, salt, zout, then from salarium to salario, salaire, salary in English. Much later, Japanese then borrowed salary from English as sarariman to mean a person who works for a salary in a corporation, well, a white collar worker. Sal was also the Latin root word for salsa, anything salted. Salsa, sauce, sauce, saucy, sass, sassy. At its core, English is a Germanic language, but it borrowed words from many other languages. It borrowed heavily from Latin, 
mostly through French. In fact, around 60% of English words are Latin in origin. That's two out of every three words. But then, if English words came from this Germanic language and Latin, where did those languages come from? Well, many ancient languages left written and historical records that allowed you to go back and study how they evolved over time into today's languages. But can you go further back to before a language even had a writing system? You see, etymologists are really good at back engineering. They examined written and historical records to understand how languages changed. This way they could build backwards to reconstruct a proto-language. Here, proto means the earliest form of a language. So, even without written records, they were able to model this proto-language that they call Proto-Indo-European. As people migrated over vast areas, they brought this Proto-Indo-European language with them, and it developed into Germanic, Balto-Slavic, Italic, that's where Proto-Latin fits in, Celtic, Hellenic, where Proto-Greek is, and Indo-Iranian languages. That's a huge spread. Business Insider has this great animated map showing how over an 8,000 year span, this proto-language spread all over Europe, Russia, and Asia. Of course, changing into other proto-languages along the way. Check below the video for the link. And what did this Proto-Indo-European develop from? Well, before that it gets really marky. You can't expect to go as far back as the first word ever uttered. <laughs> Say the first word ever uttered really fast a few times. <laughs> Etymologists believe the Proto-Indo-European root word for heart was curd. I don't know how to pronounce words in these ancient languages, so use your imagination. Then, through progressive changes in vowel and consonant sounds, curd changed into words in ancient languages. Cardia, cardio, herd, herton, hort, uh, heart. Heart is also associated metaphorically with courage and memory. From the root word to Latin cordis, of the heart to the meaning courage, coraggio, coraje, coraging. In Latin, from recordare, literally to restore to the heart, they got remember. And over time, we ended up with record, meaning to repeat, to get something by heart. And then the modern meaning, I guess when you record something, you don't forget it, right? But of course, not all words came from Proto-Indo-European to Latin to English. Proto-Indo-European also branched into Proto-Germanic, and English actually developed from that, along with German, Dutch, Scandinavian languages, and so on. The root putter branched into different languages, following something called Grimm's Law, the sound p in Proto-Indo-European becomes Germanic f and v. And that's how we got words like padre, pi, pair, and pader, but father and fata, fada and far. In some cases, Proto-Indo-European branched out from brother to brother, but frater in Latin, and then it entered English in a roundabout way as a different word with a related meaning. So we ended up with brother, brotherly, but also fraternal, meaning brotherly. From duo to duo to dos, dois, deux, and so on, duo became twi in Proto-Germanic and gave us zwei, twe, to, to, then again in a roundabout way through Latin, dual, double. That's why in English we often end up with so many different words with similar or even identical meanings, one with 
a Germanic and the other with a different origin, generally Latin or Greek. In the end, they often came from the same Proto-Indo-European root word that went through processes of phonological and semantic change, borrowing and reborrowing, and from a single ancient word, we ended up with two or more words in modern English. We can see that in these vocabulary words, broth, sap, or juice, or nectar, fear, dread, or aversion, or phobia, and so forth. Based on all these historical examples, you might think that this is all history and English is now set in stone. Oh, we've got plenty of words now, we're done. Well, English is not done at all. These processes of language change are always happening in any living language. Sounds are changing, new words emerge all the time, old words take on new meanings. Uh, that happens slowly, so we don't even notice it very much. Take the famous difference in the pronunciation of caught and caught that we are losing in North America. In places where these vowel sounds have merged into aw, there is no distinction anymore between caught and caught. Also, hardly anyone pronounces the H sound in words such as where, when, or which. So they're pronounced where and when and which and which have become homophones. Words are still being borrowed and adapted into English. Pizza, balcony, latte, buffalo, acai, cashew, sushi, haiku, manga, schadenfreude, delicatessen, boss, lanai, and so on. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Think about it, whether we speak English or Norwegian, German, Portuguese or Polish, Russian, Bengali, Persian, or Kurdish, regardless. In a way, we're all speaking the descendants of some very ancient language, a proto-language that was lost in time. Oh, insect and sex. Proto-Indo-European sec, to cut. From that, we got words such as dissect, section, and segment. In Latin, insectare, to cut into parts, insectum was used to mean an animal that's cut up into parts or has a body with segments, an insect. Possibly then, sec, sexus, because you cut up or divide beings into genders, sex. That's how insect and sex are related words. Is that cool or what? Languages change continuously, so what do you think English will be like in a hundred years? And in a thousand years? If you're multilingual, have you noticed some surprising connections between the languages you speak? Always look in the descriptions under any Snap Language video for related links. In fact, this video has some really interesting ones. If you enjoy this video, please share it and hit the like button. Of course, if you subscribe to Snap Language on YouTube, I'll be very thankful, grateful, thankful, grateful. And until the next time, thanks for stopping by and watching this video.